this word this morning, if I can say this, is not really for mom and dad, but it's for you. So you can recognize uh, who we have in our midst. Uh, again, a lot of people run different places and they run to different ministries and they listen to different men of God. And I, I can name a whole lot of them. But you tend to forget the gifts that you have right here in your midst. So because you don't recognize who they are, you don't really fight with them. See, it's time for the body of Christ here at Calvary Christian Center to battle with our man of God and not battle against him. Amen. And you might be saying, well, Pastor, I don't, I, don't, I don't battle against our man of God, but when he asks you to do something, then you come up with all sorts of excuses why you can't do it. So then you're battling against the grain. You're not working with the man of God, you're working against him. So if you want a title this morning, it's battle with your man of God. Amen. So go with me real quick. I like to use this as my opening scriptures. It's one of my favorite. Just go with me to Acts, the eighth chapter. And it's really, again, just giving honor to the pastor. That's why I use the scripture at first. Look at Acts, the eighth chapter. And look at verse four. Acts eight and four. And if you have it, say praise the Lord. If you don't have it, just say help me, Jesus, and he'll help you. Uh, look what it says there. Therefore they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to Sacramento. He went down to Marysville. He went down to Plumas Lake. He went down to Roseville, West Sacramento, East Sacramento, Rancho Cordova, Stockton, in various places. And look what it says there. And when he went down there, he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many that were taken with palsy and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Can I say this morning that there's great joy in the city of Sacramento for the great gift that we have here. Amen. So again, we, we want to honor and, and recognize our man of God. How many of you know that pastor is a deliverer? Pastor is a deliverer. Pastor has a desire to serve you. Pastor sacrifices sleep, time with his family, to pray on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Pastor understands purpose versus, or I should say this, pastor understands purpose, and purpose outweighs pleasure. He understands the purpose, what God called him to do, and who he called you to be in your life if you allow him to be it. Now look at me real quick. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. I'm not going to be long, but I'll be long enough. And if y'all can fix the clock, I'll know exactly where I'm at. Amen. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. While you're, you're turning there, there was a, a seasoned man. Uh, got blessed with a Corvette. And this seasoned man put his Corvette on the freeway. He's doing about 60, 65. And then he said, well, let me open it up to see what he could do. So he, got, he punched it up to 120 miles an hour going down the freeway. All of a sudden, he's seen these lights in his rearview mirror. The officer pulled him over and said, sir, did you notice that you were over the speed limit? He said, yes, sir, I, I, I've noticed I'm over the speed limit. He said, here's the deal. I get off work in 30 minutes. If you can give me a good excuse not to give you a ticket, I'll let you off. He said, well, sir, the reason I sped up is because my wife left me for a state trooper. And when I seen your lights, I thought you was bringing her back. (laughs) 
There's something to chew on, amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians. The fifth chapter, I learned that from pastor. See, when, 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 the, when, when the wheel's not broke, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. See, uh, again, I've been here a long time, and I remember when I first came here, I was still in the military. I was stationed right at McClellan Air Force Base, and I think I had about 12 or 13 years in, and I went to dad because I was at a dilemma about reenlisting. And he said, well, son, I believe you need to get out. And I said, okay, but pastor only got, you know, seven more years and I can get this, you know, this 20-year retirement. He said, but I, th I think you need to get out. So I obeyed my man of God. I didn't, I didn't put up no fight, you know. Deborah was a little uneasy at first, you know, but I got out. And then, you know, I still went to reserves. But I, I, I listened to the man of God because that's one thing I learned in the military is structure and how to obey authority. Again, pastor again sees things that you don't see. So he's seen something in me. So he says, son, I believe you need to get out because God's got some greater things in store for you. So out of obedience, I did that. So while, again, being in the military, I learned how to battle. And, and that's why I said the, the title again is Battling with Your Man of God because you have to learn how to fight with him and not against him. You know, I, I, I wrote this down. Uh, specifically for, for mom, you know, I said, mom is the first line of defense in the church. She's the first line of defense. And you might say, well, why is mom the first line of defense? Why? Because she's taking care of pastor. She's making sure he's healthy, making sure he eats right, making sure he exercises, and make sure that he's spending time in the word so that when he comes before you on Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, he's got a rainbow word that's going to change your life. So she's the first line of defense. Yeah. Amen. So in, in, any, in any army, you have to know how to strategically fight the adversary. So look with me at 1 Thessalonians 5. And let's start right at verse 12. And it says, I beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Verse 13 said, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, or for the word's sake, and peace among yourselves. So God has mom and dad here for a purpose, for a reason, for an assignment. Now, I remember when we were over in the chapel. This building wasn't even here yet. And we would stretch our hands for for an Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, and I remember we had Saturday night service, and then Tuesday midweek Bible study. We stretched our hand here when there was nothing here. And everybody thought Dad had lost his mind, but he knew how to hear the voice of God. So him and Mom, they've been in this thing for a long time. This is no, nothing new for them, so they know how to fight. So when the economy and different things started to shift, they didn't panic. They just girded their loins in the Word of God and kept trusting what the Word of God said and trusting what God said. See, because where God leads, he provides. Yeah. Amen. So he said, I beseech you, brother, to know them. Well, how are you going to know pastor and the strategies that he has if you don't spend time with him? See, a lot of people enlist in the army, but a lot of people sit on the sidelines. A lot of people, if I can use this terminology, go A-W-O-L absent without leave. So pastor's looking for you in the ministry. Where are you? But, but you've gone for some reason or another. Now, when things start going bad in your life, then all of a sudden you want to limp back here and start crying to pastor about what you went through. But had you listened to the general, you wouldn't have been in so many battles. Praise God. If I'm talking to you, just keep smiling. Again, this message is not necessarily for pastor, but it's for you today. I want to give you a couple points real quick, and i got a lot of stuff to get to you in a little bit of time. But don't bother the man of God with mess when he has to minister the word of God. Don't come up to pastor and say, my cat just died, my, my fish just OD'd on, on fish food. Don't, don't bother him. See, because he's laboring through the week to get the word to him, and he don't need no distractions. 
You know, I've seen a statistic that 30 minutes in the pulpit is like working an eight-hour day. 30 minutes ministering up here is like working eight hours. Some people say, you know, a pastor ain't working that hard, but you, you really don't know your pastor. He's the hardest working man I know. And he, he's constantly pushing you and trying to get you to excellence. Look with me in Acts, the sixth chapter. You know, I, I like statistics, and I, I found this one. I thought it was pretty good. And it says that 56% of all pastors' wives have no close friends. And then it said 70% of all pastors have no close friends. Well, why is that? Because every time they open themselves up, people come in, they, they hurt them, they manipulate them, they have ulterior motives. But our man and woman of God have stood the test of time. I've seen a lot of ministries go. I've seen a lot of members leave. I run into ex-members all the time. So you still at Calvary? I seen one yesterday. He said, you still here? I said, where else am I going? It's the best meal in town. Look at Acts, the sixth chapter. Acts 6. And look at verse 1. And it says, in those days when the numbers of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples with them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you uh, for men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Verse 4 said, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. See, pastor and mom's job is nothing else but to pray and get in the word so they can change your life. So they really can't be bothered with other things that are going on in the ministry. Boy, it's sure quiet on that one. Their main job is to get you the word. But how can they feed you if you constantly, if I can say this, won't get out of the pull-ups? You're still in pull-ups. You won't graduate to training pants. And everything that goes on in your life, you're crying, but they, you, you got the word. Some of you are so full of the word, you're about to burst. But what happens a lot of times, you, you start becoming like leeches. You, you take the man and woman of God for granted. Go to another church and you'll really see how blessed you are. See, pastor and mom, they don't get up here, they don't hoop and shout and dance, but they get up here and they teach you the word of God, teach you to live right. But if you don't know how to appropriate the word, you don't know how to battle with the man of God versus battling against him. Now, let me show you something here. Amen. Go with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, I think, is the 23rd chapter. Let me get over there. 2 Samuel. Praise God. And let's take a look at, uh, actually, I'm sorry, go with me, uh, the 14th chapter. So we have to learn really how to battle with our man and woman of God if you want to attain victory in every area of your life. Praise God. Now, I know I told you that. 2 Samuel 14, read that for homework. Go to the 23rd. Just testing you, amen? 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Look at verse 14. 2 Samuel, 23rd chapter, and verse 14. And this is a very uh, powerful story, but I want you to listen to this. And David was, was uh, let me back up. And David was then in a hole, 
and the garrison of the Philistine was then in Bethlehem. Verse 15, and David longed and said, oh, that I would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And there, and it says, verse 16, and three mighty men break through the host of the Philistine and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and bore it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Verse 17 said, and he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardize of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. But the point I want to bring out to you, this is story really is concerning these three men that were more concerned about the needs of their man of God versus their needs. Amen. They were more concerned about his needs. So they said, all right, pastor, you want a frappuccino? Then we're going to do whatever we need to do to get it to you. And they went in battle and then brung it back. See, some of y'all looking at me because you, you still haven't caught it yet. These, these three men, in other words, put their lives on the line because that's how important their man of God meant to them. My question to you this morning is, what are you willing to give to your man of God? What are you willing to do? These men were ready to give their lie because they realized that everything that they needed, everything that they wanted, rest in their man of God. So they were willing to do whatever. What have you given up today? This man has given his life. He's given his life so you can have the proper nourishment to be victorious in every area of your life. These three men gave up everything because they realized the importance of not just following the man of God, but making room for him. So they were willing to give up. See, I believe the problem we have here in the church today is too many selfish people. So you come and you gleam the word of God from the man and woman of God Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and oh, pastor, that was a great word and that really blessed me. But when he asks you to do something, then you come up with every excuse why you can't do it. That tells me that not only are you selfish, but you haven't really given your life for the man of God when he's laid his down for yours. I know I can hear somebody say, well, I know, Pastor, you ain't talking about me, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all these things. No, I am talking to you. I am talking to you. you know, in the book of Matthew, it, it, it talks about the good shepherd. A good shepherd. And would y'all agree with me this morning that we have a great shepherd here? Yeah. Amen. See, one thing about shepherds, if you be around them, they, they really smell like the sheep. They smell like the sheep, but if you don't spend time around the pastor, I think it was Pastor Arnold brought out this morning, that when sheep go astray, they, they break the legs. And then they carry that sheep, in other words, to, to keep them close to the shepherd. See, everything that you need in your life is related to this man and woman of God. But the farther you get away, well, pastor, I couldn't make it tonight. You know, this came up, and you understand the different things come up, but three months? <laughs> I haven't seen you for six months. What are you willing to give up? I mean, it sounds funny, but what are you really willing to give up? When they've laid their life on the line, their family sacrificed and laid their life down the line so you could be blessed. Look with me in Exodus, the 17th chapter. Exodus 17, you know, I really, my wife would tell you, you know, I was really wrestling this week, trying to get the right word, make sure I heard exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted me to give you. Know, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to contain myself. 
because this is emotional to me because, you know, this man and woman of God have done so much. I don't know about nobody else. He's done so much for me and my family that when we couldn't pray, he was praying. That's why I said battling with your man and God. When you lost all hope, when you went to bed without sleeping, he was praying for you. Praying that your kids would get delivered. Praying that your family would get saved. Praying that you would walk in healing. Praying that you would have the mind of Christ. These are all the things that the man of God did. And these three men were willing to give their life to get their man of God whatever he needed. They gave up everything to make him more prosperous, to make him more successful in ministry. And when the church learns to give up and give in, Give up and give in to the man of God. And you may say, well, you know, pastor, uh, is a, he's, a little, he's, a, he's hard on me and all that. But, and yeah, that's true. <laughs> pastor, he, he can be hard on you. But why is he hard on you? Because he sees something that you don't see. You may have came in here with low self-esteem, anger, all sorts of issues. But it wasn't until you came into a, a holy man and woman of God. See, I don't know about anybody else. When I get around pastor, you know, my wife always asks, are you nervous? Yes, I'm nervous. But it's not a, a nervous nervous, but it's in reverence to the God that's in them. And I know that when I get around them, even if, if, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, dad is saying, no, son, you need to make this adjustment. So when he tells you to do something, that's not the time for you to get an attitude. And say, well, you know, Pastor, I already know that. Well, if you already knew it, you'd be doing it. Look at Exodus 17. And let me pick it up at verse 8. Exodus 17 in verse 8. And it said, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Redephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men to go fight with Amalek tomorrow. And I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did, as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. Uh, somebody wake that brother up over there. Uh, let, let me borrow, borrow you for a minute, Pastor Braxton. Notice it said that he was fighting. And the man that God lift your hands up was standing on top of the hill with his hands lifted up. See, long as pastor's hands are lifted, whatever battle he's in, you're going to win. But if you come to pastor, oh, pastor, I really don't need you to do that. And we're going through this. He, he can't keep his hands up. You, you're distracting him. But long as he kept his hands up, the battle was won. He was battling for your children in prayer. The battle was won. When you came in that you needed healing in your body, he battled in prayer that by his stripes you're healed. And long as he kept his hands up, the victory came. See, what the adversary tries to do is distract the man of God. Pastor gets tired just like anybody else. But notice when we read that it, it said it's two men. Aaron and her came and lifted his hand. And why? Because they seen the significance in keeping their man and God's hands lifted. In other words, they were working with him, not against him. And the army went out and did what they had to do. See, the Bible says you're, you're, you're the army of Christ. But if Satan can keep our man of God weary and keep him distracted, and there's nobody around to keep his hands lifted up, See, because men of God get distracted. Men of God get discouraged. And, and I can say that now, you know, being an assistant pastor at the East Campus, there's some days when people show up and I'm looking at, trying not to look at how many people didn't come. And I had to fight that distraction. Of, and I could imagine it's multiplied seven times that with mom and dad. But they keep the faith. Yeah. They keep their hands lifted up. Why? Because somebody's constantly praying for them. The, thank you, sir. The question to, this morning is how many of you in here 
have given your life for the man of God. How many of you here will keep his hands lifted? How many of you here recognize what you have? See, I see people all the time, you know, well, well Joyce Myers is in town and, and Benny Hinn's in town and, and people will leave a regular service here on Wednesday night and run over to Sleep Train Arena. I know some of y'all probably in here. You ran over there and said, well, I know if I can just get to Benny Hinn, I'll be healed. And when you got a man and woman of God right here that got the same anointing, got the same power, got the same authority. But because you don't want to heed the instructions of the man and woman of God, you want to battle against them. Well, pastor, I'm not battling against them. He told you to get in the choir. I can't do that, Pastor. I can't sing. He told you to usher. You won't do it. He told you to open up a life group. Pastor, I can't do it. Well, now you're battling against the man of God versus battling with him. And then you're wondering why you can't receive the breakthroughs. You're wondering why you still don't have healing in your body. You're wondering why things are going to muck in your life because you're running around with a spirit of disobedience because you won't yield. Won't yield to the man of God, but every time he speaks a blessing, your hands go up. I receive that, I receive that, I receive, I receive that. But as soon as he tell you to do something that's going against your standard, he's trying to lift you up, take you to another level, but you don't want to do it. Why? Because you haven't given yourself. You haven't recognized who you have in your midst. Even though you come here, and get the word. Every week you come and get the word. But until you submit and recognize what you have, so you never appreciate what you have till it's gone. I pray mom and dad live 120 years and after that in great health, their natural strength will not be abated, neither will their eye be dim. Long life. Why? Because he has more to get to you. So you need to stop fighting against the man that God and start fighting with him. But pastor, I don't, I don't want to go to the witnessing institute. I don't want to do this. And here you got a man and woman of God that laid their life down for you. Every day. 27 years, I've been, almost 27 years, I've been around this man of God, and I've seen him go from glory to glory and from level to level. And even when attacks came against his body, even when the devil tried to take him out, him and mom out in a car accident years ago, numerous times he's been trying to take him out, but he couldn't win. And he'll never win. Because they got the power and the glory and the anointing of God, and God has an assignment that hasn't been fulfilled yet, but pastor and mom can't do it by themselves. They need you to keep their hands lifted up. Let me do this. I got about two minutes. I looked up the word salute. That word means to pay respect to pay homage to. So what I'd like you to do, congregation, is stand to your feet, and you're going to salute this great man and this great woman of God. We salute you, mom and dad. Stand up. Hallelujah. Father, we just salute this great man and woman of God. And Father, that we will not take them lightly. We recognize the calling and the anointing upon their life. And Father, we set ourselves in agreement with them today that we'll no longer fight against them, but we'll fight on the side right alongside of them. And every battle that he goes through, we go through. 
And as we go through it, that we're more victorious in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we salute this man and woman of God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 